Thanks, Sarah. Every child who attends Sunday school knows the story of Noah's Ark. Humanity had become so sinful that God decided the best thing was just to start completely over with Noah's family. So following God's instructions, Noah built a huge boat, which for some reason in English we've called an ark. And Noah gathered representative animals into the ark to keep them safe. Then a huge flood came and covered the earth, but Noah and the animals were safe in the ark. Now if you're like me, you have a thousand and one questions about this story. However, just for a few minutes, let's skip past those questions to the end of the story. After the flood waters went down and the earth became livable again, Noah and the animals left the ark and had a worship service to thank God for keeping them safe. And in that great moment in time, God made a covenant with humanity and the animals and every living creature on earth. Genesis 9 says, Then God said, I am giving you a sign of my covenant with you and with all living creatures for all generations to come. I have placed my rainbow in the clouds. It is the sign of my covenant with you and with all the earth. When I send clouds over the earth, the rainbow will appear in the clouds, and I will remember my covenant with you and with all living creatures. Never again will the flood waters destroy all life. When I see the rainbow in the clouds, I will remember the eternal covenant between God and every living creature on earth. Then God said to Noah, Yes, this rainbow is the sign of the covenant I am confirming with all the creatures on earth. So God is saying, okay, after this big flood, you guys might be a little skittish. And that's understandable. Uh, you might get scared every time it rains, but don't worry, this huge flood was a one-time deal. It will never happen again, I promise. In fact, I'll give you a rainbow as a sign of my promise. When you see the rainbow, you will remember that I promise to keep the waters under control so that life on earth, life on earth can flourish. So the rainbow is a sign of God's covenant commitment to life on earth. It is a sign that we actually have no control over, but it is a sign that God has control over us and our earth. The next sign of a covenant comes as part of Abraham's story in Genesis 17. Warning, maybe a little bit uncomfortable particularly for 50% of the congregation. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. I will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you from generation to generation. This is the everlasting covenant. I will always be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And I will give you the entire land of Canaan where you now live as a foreigner and to you and to your descendants. It will be their possession forever and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, Abraham, your responsibility is to obey the terms of a covenant. You and all your descendants have this continual responsibility. This is the covenant that you and your descendants must keep. Each male among you must be circumcised. You must cut off the flesh of your foreskin as a sign of the covenant between you and me. From generation to generation, every male child must be circumcised on the eighth day after his birth. This applies not only to members of your family, but also to the servants born in your household and the foreign born servants whom you have purchased. All must be circumcised. Your bodies will bear the mark of my everlasting covenant. Now, it's not a bad trade, really. God promises eternal faithfulness, multitudes of descendants, and the entire land of Canaan for Abraham's descendants. And all he asks for in return is a little bit of skin. Okay, it's a piece of really, really sensitive skin, but on the whole, Abraham's family was getting a bargain. I think. Guys, you can debate that later. 
later. <laughs> but why this? Why did God choose circumcision as the sign of his covenant with Abraham? Okay, warning, here comes a gross history lesson. Ancient people didn't really know about how the female reproductive organs work. They didn't know about ovaries and eggs and all of that stuff. They thought that the female provided only a passive womb. So in the act of sex, the male deposited the seed of life into the woman. That's like you've heard in the Bible, Abraham's seed. That's because of this understanding of reprodu reproduction. And so then that seed grew in the woman in her womb. All right. So therefore, for many, many ancient cultures, the penis was the sign of life the essence of procreation, the essential vessel for continuing humanity. This is why so many ancient cultures had these phallic symbols in their worship. Okay, it seems kind of gross to us, but lots of ancient cultures had these long penis-shaped objects as part of their worship culture because they considered the male sex organ to be the center of the universe, the essence of life or the source of life. Okay, end of gross history lesson. You can I, start paying attention again, <laughs> or unplug your ears. So why circumcision? God says, mark this emblem of life with my seal. Your descendants, your future, will come forth from my covenant. Your future depends on me and my blessing. Your inmost private parts and your most private acts are marked with your commitment to me and my commitment to you. Your life and your future depend on me, not on yourselves. I'm in control of your life and your future, not you. This is the sign of the covenant. Later, God instituted a specific ceremony to serve as a sign of his covenant with Israel. It's actually a series of festivals or special meals centering on one meal called the Passover meal. And that was a meal remembering when God set Israel free from Egypt. For us today, the most important part of this ceremony is how it functions for Israel as a sign of the covenant with God. Listen as I read from Exodus 13. So Moses said to the people, This is a day to remember forever the day you left Egypt, the place of your slavery. Today the Lord has brought you out by the power of his mighty hand. This annual festival will be a visible sign to you, like a mark branded on your hand or on your forehead. Let it remind you always to recite this teaching of the Lord. With a strong hand, the Lord rescued us from Egypt. And in the future, your children will ask you, what does all this mean? Then you will tell them, with the power of his mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, the place of our slavery. This ceremony will be like a mark branded on your hand or on your forehead. It is a reminder that the power of the Lord's mighty hand brought us out of Egypt. Okay, so it keeps saying this phrase again and again. This annual festival will be a visible sign to you, like a mark branded on your hand or your forehead, a reminder that the power of the Lord's mighty hand brought us out of Egypt. So the Passover festivities were like this living tattoo on the life of Israel. Through this annual celebration, Israel tattoos their hearts every year with the reminder that God brought them out of slavery in Egypt. We need reminders. We need help remembering. And we forget where we put our keys or our cell phone. Uh, we definitely need help to remember deeply that God truly sets us free. God sets us free. We don't become free by our own hard work. The Passover is a sign of the covenant to help us remember. There's one more time in the Bible where the Bible talks about, it uses this phrase, the sign of the covenant, and that is in Exodus 31. 
To really understand how important this passage is, though, you have to understand what's been happening in Exodus before this. In the first third of Exodus, God was working in Egypt to set Israel free from slavery. And then, once Israel was actually free, the second third of the book was God making a covenant with Israel. The covenant ceremony really begins officially in chapter 19. God says, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure among all the peoples on earth. And the people responded, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. That God hasn't commanded anything yet. But they say they're going to do it, whatever it is. Then for about ten chapters, there's this long covenant-making ceremony. First, God gives Israel a long list of rules about how to live. This includes things like the Ten Commandments and how to live in a fair and just society. Then God calls 70 leaders of Israel up on a mountain for a special covenant confirmation ceremony. And after that ceremony, uh, God spends six chapters, I think, six and a half chapters, describing the holy tabernacle that he wants Israel to build uh, so that they can worship God closely. And finally, after a total of about 12 chapters describing God's covenant ceremony with Israel, we come to our main text for today. This is the last part of this long ceremony talking about God forming a covenant with Israel. And these are God's chosen words, his closing words for this whole covenant ceremony. Listen closely. Then the Lord gave these instructions to Moses. Tell the people of Israel, be careful to keep my Sabbath day. For the Sabbath is a sign of the covenant between me and you from generation to generation. It is given so that you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. You must keep the Sabbath day, for it is a holy day for you. Anyone who desecrates it must be put to death. Anyone who works on that day will be cut off from the community. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day must be a Sabbath day of complete rest, a holy day dedicated to the Lord. Anyone who works on the Sabbath must be put to death. The people of Israel must keep the Sabbath day by observing it from generation to generation. This is a covenant obligation for all time. It is a permanent sign of my covenant with the people of Israel. For in six days, the Lord made the heaven and earth, but on the seventh day, he stopped working and when the Lord finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant written by the finger of God. The Sabbath is the sign of the covenant. The Sabbath is the sign of God's commitment to people and people's commitment to God. God could have finished his covenant-making ceremony in a thousand different ways. God could have restated the first commandment. You shall have no other gods but me. God could have summarized everything like he later did through Jesus. Love God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. God could have ended the promise, ended with a promise for blessing and curses for disobedience like he did in Deuteronomy. But God didn't do any of that. Instead, God ended this huge covenant ceremony with Israel by telling them, be careful to keep my Sabbath day, for the Sabbath is a sign of the covenant between me and you. This week, I've been wondering if the Sabbath might actually be the most important commandment. It's the one commandment that is repeated the most often in the Torah and the first five books of the Bible called the law. This commandment is repeated more than any other. 
Now, I know that Jesus said the most important commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and with all your soul. And the second most important is to love your neighbor as yourself. And I definitely don't want to argue with Jesus. Okay? So maybe, maybe the Sabbath commandment comes in in third place. Here's what I mean. The great Jewish rabbi Ahad Haman made an observation that every Jew has recognized as a deep truth and that people have been quoting ever since. He said, more than Jews have kept the Sabbath, the Sabbath has kept the Jews. A modern day rabbi named Arya Kaplan explains it like this. The Sabbath is one of the most important ingredients in Jewish survival. It is no exaggeration to say that the Jew has survived 2,000 years of persecution and humiliation largely because he had the Sabbath. It was one factor that not only made him survive, but kept him alive, both spiritually and morally. Without the Sabbath, the Jew would have vanished. In a positive sense, the Sabbath is the focus of Jewish belief. Once each week, the Jew spends a day reinforcing his belief in God, and as long as Jews keep the Sabbath, God remains an integral force in their lives. Their faith is like a rock, and nothing can shake it. All the waves of persecution and prejudice break before this rock of faith. I've been seriously studying the Sabbath for the past year, and I'm beginning to realize that the Sabbath is the hinge on which our lives turn. The Sabbath is the hook on which our faith hangs. The Sabbath is the sinews that hold together the body of Christ. In itself, keeping the Sabbath is definitely not more important than having only one God and not worshiping idols. But keeping the Sabbath reminds us constantly that we have only one God and it gives us the strength to say no to the many cultural idols that beg for our attention and allegiance. Okay, good Sabbath practice is not more important than not stealing, not committing adultery, not covenant, coveting, and not murdering others. But resting together on the Sabbath helps us to live more honest lives and to have better families and happier marriages healthier marriages too. Keeping the Sabbath is a celebration of what we have that frees us from the greed and competition that fuels the world at large. And like we read today in our gospel passage, Jesus reminded us again and again that obeying legalistic Sabbath rules is not more important than loving people or taking care of people. But. A basic grace-filled practice of the Sabbath actually helps us love people more. Resting, recovering, reconnecting with God, and rebuilding our families, all of this gives us the internal strength and resources to be more loving and grace-filled in our daily interactions with others. Jesus redirects our attention regularly to loving God with all our hearts, minds, and strength. And of course, we need to do this every day. Last week, someone asked a really good question on one of the talk back cards. You guys are starting to ask more questions and more difficult questions. So that's great. Keep it up. Here, let me just read that question for you. I agree that taking a day of rest is important, especially when we use that day to focus on God and fellowship. However, this is all I hear. From personal experience, just one day is not enough. Having only one day where I focus on God will not sustain me through a whole week. I need to have some moments each day where I focus on God. So my question is, why the focus on the one day of the Sabbath? Will people feel like that's enough? Shouldn't we also teach and encourage daily time alone with God as equally important? That's a great question. Why are we spending five weeks talking about one day? Of course we need daily prayer time, Bible reading, and spiritual direction, spiritual reflection. But here's the deal. Without the Sabbath, 
most of us will not have the emotional strength or mental discipline to actually spend time with God each day. Without one whole day of rest and recovery with God and family, most of us will live the rest of the week as one long blur of activity. Ignore God on the Sabbath, and we will ignore God the rest of the week too. So as a pastor, I'm making a strategic decision to help us live all of our other days for God by focusing on winning the battle for the one day of the Sabbath. And actually, I think that's the plan that the Bible gives us. Exodus 31 tells us that God gave us the Sabbath day so that we will know that God is the Lord who makes us holy. We have the Sabbath so that we will know God. Keeping the Sabbath is a sign to us and to those around us that our covenant with God is the single most important aspect of our lives. Our relationship with God defines all of our other relationships. Our relationship with God fuels all of our other relationships. Resting with God enables us to work with God for the other six days. A good Sabbath practice defines how we live on the other six days. Like the rainbow, the Sabbath reminds us that God is in control and we're not. Like circumcision, the Sabbath remind us, reminds us that God is the source of our lives, not us and our own actions. Like Passover, the Sabbath is a living tattoo that reminds us that God has set us free. Keep the Sabbath as a sign of our covenant with God and your relationship with God will grow stronger and stronger. Okay, so now we're in week three of our Sabbath series, and it may be time to do a little bit of review. So far, we've considered the three main reasons for the Sabbath. First, we looked at Exodus 20 and how in the Ten Commandments, God tells us to take a day of rest because God rested after his six days of work in creating the universe. On the Sabbath, we rest from our work to remember God as the creator and sustainer of the universe. We remember that our lives actually depend on God and not on us and our work. Then last week, we took another look at the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy chapter 5, where God tells us to take a day of rest because we are not slaves. Working seven days a week is what slaves do. That's what people do who are slaves to the system. But we aren't slaves. God has set us free, figuratively in the Exodus, and literally through Christ. And since Christ has set us free, let's stay free. And today, we looked at the last reason for the Sabbath, it is a sign of God's covenant with humanity. Keeping the Sabbath keeps God first in our lives. Keeping the Sabbath enables us to keep all of the other commandments too. Keeping the Sabbath, keeping it well, helps us to truly live and love like God. In the next two weeks of our series, we'll study the blessings of the Sabbath and look at how to actually practice the Sabbath as 21st century Christians, right? So we know the Sabbath isn't about legalism. Jesus made that abundantly clear. What is it about and how do we do it? This is a pathway to more grace and blessing. This is basic wisdom about how to live a good and peace-filled life. So don't miss out. Make sure you're here the next couple of weeks as we talk about the practice of how to have a good Sabbath. For now, listen again as I read slowly what God said in Exodus 31. This is at the close of the covenant ceremony. Out of all the possible things that God could have said to conclude his covenant with Israel, all of the different ways he could summarize and wrap this up, 
And this is what he said. Be careful to keep my Sabbath day. For the Sabbath is a sign of the covenant between me and you from generation to generation. It is given so you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day must be a day of Sabbath rest, a Sabbath day of complete rest, a holy day dedicated to the Lord. This is a covenant obligation for all time. It is a permanent sign of my covenant with the people Israel. For in six days, the Lord made the heaven and the earth, but on the seventh day, he stopped working and was refreshed. Church, this is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Hansel, would you pray for us?